right, settle down now, children. Daddy Christopher's here and Uncle Tom. Back with you once again on The Strange and Deadly Show. This is a podcast dedicated to the Section 3 list, a cachet of films related to Britain's video Nazis. That's right, so we pair up these films based on a theme and then discuss and review them for your and hopefully our entertainment. Uh, You can subscribe to the show on iTunes or any podcatcher and you can find more information about us and the other shows on the network over at gentlemensgrindhouserecords.com Com. Then we'll tell you how you can get feedback, comments and questions over to us at the end of the show. Well, here we are. Uh, country's gone to hell in the handbasket, it's fair to say. Our country is divided. Everybody has Kung Fu fighting. Ha! Hoo-ha! But it's okay. It's a, Don't laugh at this. Talk. It's a serious matter. Okay, the country's hurting and we're here to help them. I, of course, am Christopher Clayton. And who am I joined by there? This is Tom Elliott. Good to speak to you again, Chris. It's been a while. Good to speak to you, sir. Yes, indeed. You were laughing there at the nation's hurt. How could you? I was more laughing at the kung fu fighting part, to be honest. But uh, yes, it's uh, turbulent times, but we, as always, will do our best to uh, put a smile on people's faces. The kung fu fighting part was good, though, wasn't it? Yeah. That's probably... That's a, that's the highlight of the show. You need go no further, Tom. That's it. Can't get any better than that. But yes, it's a turbulent time indeed, but uh, we're not going to talk about that anymore. We're here to bring you fun. That's the main thing. It's always been really our goal in giving you the show is to cheer you up, put a smile upon those lips, not just the ones on your face. <laughs> that's that's where we're at. I've lost myself, Tom. I've lost myself in a mire of jokes, but uh, don't worry about it. Let's let's bring it back on in. Bring it back on Get in. Get together. Uh, we, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> rein me in, Tom. Rein me in. Uh, well, we're here again, and it's been a while, hasn't it? And uh, it's all my fault, Tom. Uh, it has to be said this time around. It's not always been my fault. But um, we keep sort of coming back for an episode or two and then going away again. And and uh, the last time we recorded an episode was back in April. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've not n- nobody has seen us since then. Although, of course, you've probably been keeping up with us on Twitter. Hopefully you have. Uh, if you don't venture into the social medias, then you probably have no idea what's been happening where we've been. But uh, we, we do keep people updated on there. Uh, I'm not going to, again, you know, I want to keep everybody relatively cheery. So I'm not going to go into too much detail, but... Most of you guys will probably know, some of you at least, that I suffer from pretty debilitating depression and I have moments where there are depressive relapses that are pretty, you know, they pretty much knock me to the ground, knock me into the mud for a while and it's hard for me to pull myself out of that and unfortunately um, The Strange and Deadly Show seems to suffer when that happens. Like I say, that that isn't always the reason why we've taken these extended breaks and hiatus, but um, it was this time around. I got sick a couple of times. You can probably hear in my voice that I'm sort of coming out of a cold that I have. I couldn't couldn't speak for a while, um, which most people were grateful for, <laughs> to be honest with you, Tom. Uh, probably yourself included, but I'm back now, talking again, uh, here to annoy everybody. But how have you been in the meantime, Tom? Well, Chris, let me be Samwise Gamgee, picking you up onto my shoulders <laughs> and taking you to the top of Mount Doom at uh, the end of Return of the King and uh, we'll get through it together my friend um, I'm alright you know I am fine just ticking along been doing a bit of Twilight Zone podcasting but it's the summer so you know I've been gallivanting around like you know like a lunatic so I'm fine I'm very well I'm very well well I'm glad to hear it my friend you joined Instagram Mm-hmm. since the last time that we recorded an episode and for some reason Tom you felt um you took it upon yourself to post several photos uh showing off I would say showing off showing how fit you are um oh look at the f- f- food I eat from the <laughs> from the from the fit men who cook and then oh look at the the, the fitness regime I do why are you gonna do that why are you gonna make people like me people who resemble blobs why are you gonna why are you gonna make us feel bad <laughs> well not many people know this but everyone knows this now I am a bit of a fitness dude you know what I mean but mm-hmm. I hate fitness bores so I try not to but you've got to have some outlet for these things and I do it on Instagram. Don't get me wrong. There's not pictures of me with my shirt off all over Instagram. But I do like to, you know, get a little bit of, of something, something out there. It's fine, Tom. You know, if you want to put the rest of us down, that's that's all right. I, I You know, uh, if you want to be... You're supposed to do social media for good, not for evil. But <laughs> if that's the way you want to go, that's, that's fine. But I, I've missed you, my friend. I've missed talking to you. And you. 
and uh, I've missed talking to you guys out there, all five, six of you that still listen. Uh, we've missed you, missed chatting with you. Of course, we speak to several of you on, on uh, Twitter, so we, we know you're there. But uh, how have you lot been? You must let me know. Forget all that for now, though, Tom. Forget the pleasantries and all the rest of it. It's time to be mean about a film, potentially. Maybe not. We just don't know. We just don't know. Maybe we'll like it. Why don't you tell everybody what the theme of this show is and what films we're covering on the episode. It's going to be another double bill, and it's not rapey. No, thank goodness for that. This time round, it's a theme about Mad Doctors. Now, the thing about Mad Doctors is they've been around since the dawn of horror, really, haven't they? In in the movie Mm. world, especially, there's, you know, the famous one is, of course, Frankenstein's monster. Then we've got... Things like Dr. Moreau um, come on more to- towards the modern age. We've got Herbert West in Reanimator. So, you know, it's something the horror always latches onto. And there's always this thing, you know, are they doing what they're doing for the right reasons? Um, a lot of the time, in their own minds, they're doing the right thing because they think it's the right thing to do, but they push things further than anyone else. And that gives us a good place to um for them to create monstrosities and to create mayhem so it's a it's a ripe little sort of subgenre within horror and i think you know if someone sort of took that topic and ran with it there's probably you know tons of films out there i think that's a job for jim moon personally but we're mm. going to do our bit with this double bill of the mad doctor of blood island and uh, massacre mansion what about Dr. Dre, Tom? Is he one of the mad doctors or... Um... Um, doc, Dr. Zhivago? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, well, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, all right, well, I'm going to tell you all about a little film called Mad Doctor of Blood Island, one that I've actually owned since I was probably a teenager or certainly in my early 20s and I never bothered to watch it. Really? Uh, no, no, not at all. No, it came in as part of a... Um, I mean, I'm going to talk about the release information, obviously, at the end of the review of this one. But, um, yeah, I've, I've had a, a review... A review, sorry. I had a release of it from the Cult Collection. I think it was released by... Um, who was it? Cinema Club. Mm. Uh, they released it. And I had, like, a little box set of these films under this, you know, this marquee of the Cult Collection. And this is one of them. And uh, yeah, never bothered to watch it at all. But I seem to remember there were like some stickers in the box that came with it. And I stuck up a sticker on an old bookcase that I had. And it was The Mad Doctor of Blood Island. So I've known about the film for a while, but never bothered to uh, to see it. So here it is, released in 1969. Also known as Blood Doctor, The Revenge of Doctor X and Tomb of the Living Dead. And it was directed by Gerardo de Leon and Eddie Romero. And it stars John Ashley, Angelique Pettyjohn. Ronald Remy and Ronaldo Valdez. I'm going to read the synopsis to you now. We begin with a message from Dr. Bill Foster, a pathologist, who tells us that only a sample of green blood will prevent you from becoming a monster. We see a girl die shortly afterwards, running through trees and meeting her doom at the hands of a deadly, mutilated man, his face lit up the colour green with sores and deformities. It seems that here on Blood Island, there's a monster stalking the natives. That's the sort of trouble Dr. Foster and his lady Sheila are about to walk into. Bill is here in search of more information on the green blood, while Sheila wants to find her drunken father. Carlos, a young man who has travelled with them, seeks to find his mother and take her away from the island. He lived here when younger, and his father, Don Ramon, is now at rest in a nearby stone coffin. They all meet Dr. Lorca, who welcomes them to the island. Bodies begin turning up mysteriously, having been beaten and pulled apart. Foster finds a man on the brink of death outside his cabin, his skin almost completely green, which Dr. Lorca puts down to chlorophyll poisoning. It soon transpires that things are most definitely not what they seem on the island. Marla, a young native girl, reveals that she had an affair with Don Ramon, very much her senior. He was the only man she ever loved. It's clear that Dr. Lorca is keeping secrets, which spill out as events get bloodier. The truth emerges as Carlos and Foster investigate, discovering, here comes a spoiler, that the deadly monster is none other than Carlos's father, Don Ramon, mutilated and living in agony because of experiments done on him by Dr. Lorca. More death is set to come, as Foster finds Lorca's lab preparing for a deadly showdown, all while Marla inches closer to finding her former lover, hoping she can make him listen. You enjoy taking great risks, don't you? Especially with other people's lives. 
how well we understand each other. Better than you think, doctor. Tell me, was you worth killing your husband for? You mean sexually? Yes. I don't know, really. If I ever killed anyone in cold blood, I'd probably do it for profit. I'm sure that disgusts you. After all, you became a whore for love. Yes. I was 14 when he took me. No man has ever been more to me. No man. Not before. Not since. Don Ramon has been dead for seven years. You are quite mad. Then you should be very careful, doctor. Both of you. Mad people can be quite unpredictable. No one is predictable. Not wholly. Be happy in your work, murderer, until your own time comes. You poor deluded fool. If I had a sentiment to spare, I'd pity you. Right-ho, Mr. Tom Elliott. A first time for us, for both of us, mm-hmm. on this film. What did you think of The Mad Doctor of Blood Island? Well, I came to this one with a, a kind of a mixture of interest because it's very old-fashioned in a lot of ways and then there's a lot of blood, gore and boobs in it as well. So it kind of straddles two worlds. Um, amusement because it's a bit of a cheese fest, isn't it? And yeah. uh, maybe a tad bit of boredom as well, uh, unfortunately. I uh, the, it's not it's not a good film uh, that I, I think. But the thing with a film like this is whether it can sort of get you on that cheese factor, that camp factor, and just be a bit of a silly good time. And I, I felt it was part of the way there, you know, but. It, at one and a half hours long, I was uh, starting to to look at my watch a bit. You know, it's um, it is a bit campy. It is a bit fun. It's got a bit of gore, ridiculous dialogue. So the ingredients are kind of there, but we've seen it before on this section three list where, you know, a film isn't good in the usual sense of the word. Um, so you just want it to be that cheesy good time that you you're looking for, but if it's just not quite silly enough or not quite cheesy enough, then it, it comes up short. And unfortunately, this was kind of like the, that for me. I didn't hate it. I was kind of mildly amused and mildly entertained by it, but um, that's the best I can really say. So, what about you? Yeah, it, it is bad, isn't it? Mm. But it's not. I was. It's not offensively bad. No. And it 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 is. I mean, God, they're trying, aren't they? They're trying with, with, with obviously very little, and and all the sort of, all the tricks are there, really. All the sort of low budget tricks. You know, every time the monster comes around, uh, the camera zooms in and out really quickly. You know, it's that very sort of look. The screen is shaking, but it's not. It's just somebody with a zoom button who's uh, getting a little bit uh, excited about it. It, it yeah, I, I, it's funny, you know. Um, obviously I don't want to spoil the feedback that's going to come later on in the show but it, the word boredom is one that wasn't used by anybody else really and I, I have to agree with you I, I did find a little bit of that setting in yeah. um, throughout I, I, there was a few times where I found myself you know the sort of looking at your watch kind of mentality where it's like oh okay I mean it's going on a bit uh, but <laughs> but it, it's sort of spirited in its not badness mm. i would say uh, not a very good way to describe it but you know what i mean it, it is yeah super cheesy and trashy and it's yeah the boobs and the blood and it's very it's very b it's a it's a real true b movie yeah. and in that respect it's hard to dislike it really with all of its many many flaws because because it it's not a film that's trying to be art whatsoever it's no. sort of i think it i think they kind of knew what they were making you know and so I think in that respect, a success, like I say, in that respect, a success. But yeah, I, I, I had I had a bit of difficulty with it and I found it quite tedious in, in, in places. But but man, it seemed like they were having fun making it and, uh, and more power to them. Really. Not something I would ever watch again, I have to say. Uh, it's a one and done sort of deal for me. But Definitely. But a couple of interesting bits in there, you know, there's a little bit of that sort of, I mean, this was a, this was a Filipino horror film, 
uh, horror movie made in the Philippines, and there were a bunch of these. There was um, this is actually part of a trilogy, in fact, which we'll we'll get into a little See, bit that, later on. That blows my mind, to be honest. I wasn't aware of that, mm. so that is uh, absolutely crazy, to be honest. It, neither was I until I started uh, researching, and mm. then found it. Yeah, okay, this is actually there are more of these, um, <laughs> and you know I admire any country that tries to have a little bit of horror output. You know, tries to make some films, and it seemed like Filipino horror was gathering some sort of popularity. It probably wasn't, you know, massive, but they were trying, and I think uh, you know I, I I commend them for that. It's uh, I don't think I've seen a Filipino horror film before, really. I mean, it's mostly English speaking actors in here, as far as I can tell. Um, I don't know if anybody was... I got the impression that some of these people were dubbed over, but but I just don't know. Uh, John Ashley is is somebody who is the main guy here, Dr. Uh, Bill Foster. is somebody who, as, as far as I've read, I haven't seen... I have to you know, confess I haven't seen him in anything else, really, but uh, well, not that I'm... Certainly, not, I wasn't aware of him in particular, if I, if I had done, but he's somebody who was a bit of a star in America at, at one point and then kind of made the transition into doing these, these B-grade movies and, and actually quite enjoyed making these movies in a different part of the world where they they weren't really doing it before so an interesting thing and a sort of you know late 60s curio isn't it it is it is i mean the the setup here we've probably seen it before with a million things you know zombie flesh eaters comes to mind uh mm. in, a, in a slightly different way but we've got this boat going towards this island and bill the doctor you've just mentioned and his uh, female friends Sheila who look like Ken and Barbie kind of pulled out of the box <laughs> yeah. don't they and, Very much so. and I think it's um, you know you find it a lot with countries making horror movies and they think they we've, we've got to appeal to the mass market we've got to appeal to that western you know American market so they've got Bill very square jawed with his lovely tall hair and Sheila with a you know little dress and big boobs and big Buffonte hairstyle and on this boat but we've also got Carlos as well who's coming to the island to try and find his mother and bring her away but you know once they get there that's when all hell doesn't break loose straight away but we get there and Carlos finds his mother and you're kind of starting to wonder whether he wants to take it away to to have sex with her, to be honest, because the sort it's, of... it's funny you said that. I, I thought exactly. I was waiting for the incest moment to come in. I thought because yeah. it, it did seem like that, didn't it? Because he said to her uh, something like, "I'm the handsome prince, come to rescue the the helpless princess," or something like that. And I thought, is there going to be a bit of you know, is there a bit of incest happening? And it, it it never happened again. There wasn't another moment like that. But you're, you're absolutely right. I thought, blimey, this is going to get a bit salacious, isn't it? <laughs> well, that's it. And, you know, you wonder whether, I don't know whether it's the language uh, issue with it, but surely people know what a princess and a prince are, no matter what language you're writing in. So it was very odd. But then that young girl comes along, doesn't she? The young, attractive woman. I can't mm-hmm. remember her name. And she's... Marla. Marla, okay. Well, yeah. And she's like to Carlos, um, you know, oh, hi, how you doing, blah, blah, blah. And Carlos is like, oh, it's good to see you. You brought me so much joy when I was a child. And she says, yes, and maybe in your manhood too. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, totally laying it on. And it's funny, the, the delivery of Carlos's lines that you just did there, that's why I was laughing, because the man has no emotion. No whatsoever everything he delivers is as flat as is humanly possible even when he says you know you brought me a lot of joy it's like i don't think you've ever experienced joy in your <laughs> life i don't think you've experienced emotions before but yeah she comes in offering him everything under the sun yeah really but she's got you know there's something strange and sort of alluring about her and a little bit you can tell that she's keeping a secret as well that's right that's right which we will come to at the end of the film but it's funny, really. She's this, I mean, beautiful young girl with a very sort of deadpan delivery too. Uh, very, she seems like she's a bit tortured. You know, there's something going on behind the scenes with her, and you don't exactly know what it is. Which, which kind of brings me to the next thing: it, the way people talk to each other in the film is so completely. It's like cliched lines plucked out of every other mm. film, isn't it? And and put together. Yeah. Now, there's there's one and. Because they're all such bad actors, the emphasis that they put on words <laughs> is always at the wrong time, you know. And I remember having this conversation with the doctor, Dr. Lorca, and uh, 
Yes. <laughs> and and she's like, um, you enjoy taking great risks, especially with other people's lives. And the doctor's like, how well we know each other. And she says, <laughs> better than you think, doctor. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> it's like this bad soap opera dialogue, isn't it? Where everyone's yeah. like, hmm, 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 you know? <laughs> <laughs> and and it really is like that. You might think Tom's kind of laying it on a bit, but he's not at all. It, it is like no, there's no chemistry between anybody in this at all. So if you're wondering, you're thinking, oh, we might get a bit, a good bit of spicy dialogue or something like that. There's none of that here at all. It is pretty, yeah. It it is people. It's actors <laughs> reading pretty well rehearsed lines, mm. rather than you know. But I mean, that's to be expected. Like yeah, like we always say, we're not expecting thespians in in films like this. But but this was especially flat across the whole cast really it was it was i um I, I suppose we should talk about i mean everyone gets to the island you know they're starting to make these connections they're starting to talk to each other and then our monster kind of creeps in doesn't he yeah who is now i wonder what did you think of the makeup effects on this guy well if you took like a cow path put a load of grass in it, mixed it all up and a bit of dog hair and then shaped it around someone's head. That's kind of where we're at, I think. Are you, are you telling me they dipped this man's head in shit? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Is that what they did? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd say you're probably right about that. It's not great, is it? Uh, but I, I think the look of the of the guy is, it, it could kind of be okay, but... I have a problem with the fact that whenever he attacks anybody, it's just this sort of cliched kind. It's, if you like, it's a Frankenstein's monster sort of thing where it's just like, yeah. you know, and then and bashing him with his arms. And, that, and and that's about it, really. There's no, I never felt any true menace from, from the monster at all. No. Well, well, at one point he slaps someone's arm off, which was good. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. He just sort of swings his arm and slaps this fella and his arm comes flying <laughs> off. Um, you got to give him credit. I mean, he can take people apart pretty quickly, even though most of that happens off screen. But, of course, you see the after, the the, the shot of it afterwards. Yeah. So you know that it's happened. And, yeah, he's pretty good at taking people apart. But I don't think a, a particularly, particularly menacing character but as we go through the story we do sort of learn obviously as we go, go towards the end especially we learn why you know who the monster is and, and why he is that way and um and then i i think i think there's a sympathetic beat to him definitely i think when he is roaming around the woods he reminds me of kind of 50s creature features which mm -hmm. would promise you the earth in their trailer and promise you the earth on their poster well, when you get to it, it's a guy dressed lo up like an octopus, sort of waving his <laughs> arms through the woods kind of thing, which is endearing in its own way. You know, if you can tap into that cheese factor, then there's probably a lot of enjoyment to get out of this. And, you know, sometimes I did, sometimes I didn't. I think this sits along alongside those quite comfortably, the, the 50s and 60s films, mm. particularly the ones in the 50s. I think if, you'd, if this was in black and white, and obviously... You know, the sort of the sexual content was toned down a little bit because there are sort of boobs and things like that here and there, and there is a sex scene in it. Not much of one, but there there is one. Um, I think that that it could very easily, you know, you could fool somebody into thinking this came right out of the fifties. You know, even the title screen of it when the font comes up and it's just out of a fifties B movie. Yeah, totally out of it. And the music too, yeah, so, the, this very big mm. orchestral dun, 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 music. Yeah, yeah, and there's and it's all there. You know, dun 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 dun. dun. You know, it's all that's <laughs> my impression of drums there. I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> but it's um, you know, the rolling drums and people running through the woods and it, you know it's got all of that really but so we move through the story anyway and we we people start to uncover that there's there's something not quite right here on this island tom um sheila is a bit shrieky isn't she and doesn't really do very much no i would say i think that the two best characters are, are, are probably bill and um and carlos although like i say carlos delivery is not good Delivery is not good. Although he went on to do quite a lot of work, the actor who did that, so maybe he got better. But um, delivery is extremely flat from him. But they they start to uncover a plot here. I think it's fairly obvious. I mean, well, the film is called The Mad Doctor of Blood Island, so you pretty much know what you're in for. But it's pretty obvious right from the get go that Doctor Lorca is the guy, mm. um, not the guy who is the monster, the guy who is orchestrating the whole thing. And bodies begin, like we said in the synopsis, they begin turning up mysteriously, and they're trying to work out what's going on here and. 
at one point there's one of the the captives i suppose the people who dr lorca have been taking away and running experiments on he wants to try and cure illnesses um we're going to get into what exactly what he was doing to have created the monster a bit later on but this guy turns up outside the cabin where uh, bill and sheila are staying and he's a guy who has turned green Mm-hmm. clearly painted green of course um with the uh dipped in shit just like uh <laughs> tom said and uh and he's there and he's laying on the bed and he can barely speak and he can barely move and dr lorker comes in they call him in and of course he immediately is fearful of him so you know right there obviously dr lorker is the one who's doing this and he blames it on chlorophyll poisoning mm. um interesting thing interesting subject um is in the end, not far wrong because he was experimenting with with chlorophyll, as we we find out later. Um, but they, you know, get very very suspicious at this point, and I think they work out pretty quickly exactly what's going on. Um, it's no great secret. I mean, how around this sort of point in the stories, we're sort of in the, around the middle of the film. I felt like there were several points where things just slowed down a little bit too much. You know, this sort of film, this trashy, fun, cheesy kind of film, I would like to have seen it kind of ramping up. Yeah. And to keep going instead of you know don't you keep slowing it down but the audience already knows what's happening so it's like get to the point now and i think i completely agree with that but i also and i was going to ask you this question mm-hmm. when you're doing a mad doctor movie you want your mad doctor to be completely you know magnetic um have a great presence i mean if you look at hair but west maybe I, yeah. i'm going to the top of the you know the heap here because I I hold him in very high regard. Jeffrey Coombs um, mm-hmm. playing Herbert West. Um, you know you can't take your eyes off the man. He's he's brilliant. You disagree with him, but you just can't you can't help but just be enraptured by him. I mean, what did you think of this Mad Doctor? Not a lot to him, really, is there? <laughs> he just sort of just kind of walks around a bit, really glaring at people. Um, I think has a, a tiny bit of magnetism to him in terms of, I suppose, uh, I I get the impression that, you know, based on the character, he would have charmed people mm. into believing the things that he was saying, which is why we end up with the, the monster we ended up with. I could imagine him to be a somewhat charming person. But no, I mean, if we're comparing him to somebody like Herbert West, um, no competition whatsoever. In- incidentally, by the way, I've got a video that my girlfriend got for me, which is of, of um, Jeffrey uh, uh, Combs, Wishing me happy birthday, oh, and wow. uh, and naming me, and I'm <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you, Tom. I watched that video and I came all over my own face. <laughs> I just was so unbelievably excited. It was you wouldn't believe it. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, um, I to be honest, I agree. He, he wasn't he wasn't terrible. No worse than anyone else in the film, but mm-hmm. he. he it's probably unfair to compare him to the best of the best, but saying that your mad doctor should have a certain magnetism, you know, what's he going to do next kind of thing. And this, he was, he was more of a, I don't know, more of a gangster. He looked like more of a gangster than a mad doctor, to be honest. But, um, but yeah, unfortunately it, it just fell short there as well for me. Well, he wasn't particularly mad. I mean, that's that's the thing you expect from the title of the film. I was expecting a sort of mad, giggly doctor, you know, maniacal to some degree. And like you say, I mean, he's pretty passive through the whole thing. He really only tries to do anything uh, towards the end of the film, really, when he sort of, you know, throws a couple of punches or whatever. But that's about it for for most of it. Yeah, pretty, I would say, you know, not particularly tempestuous or anything like that. Just more of an observer, really, of the things around him and and... So to call it the Mad Doctor of Blood Island, I think is a bit, yeah. I think it it missells the film because he ain't no Mad Doctor. No, no. It's a bloody island, but there ain't no Mad Doctor on it. Uh, so at some point, Tom, we get to the point where everybody's starting to work out what's going on. Of course, you then, I mean, I it works it out fairly quickly, I think, uh, that the monster was actually Carlos's father, Don Ramon, mm. who had leukemia. And came to Dr. Lorca, and Dr. Lorca said, well, look, I can help you, I can treat you. And there was this sort of plant, the, the chlorophyll, like we were talking about before, and he managed to treat the leukaemia, and Don Ramon got a lot better, but then began to sort of, to mutate, and 
and started getting these horrible sores and, and basically ended up becoming this creature. And they ended up, co- you know, they ended up covering up his death. They faked his death. And I guess just sort of threw him out there into the into the old woods there, mm-hmm. and he became the monster of Blood Island. And so there is that sympathetic angle to it. Uh, the problem is that I think the creature is the, the creature is not menacing enough to where I felt partic- You know, I didn't feel scared of the creature at all. And then there's also the fact that I I don't know if if there was ever a sort of truly redemptive quality to to Don Ramon. It, in the vein of somebody like Swamp Thing, for example, who I think is, if you ever look at Alan Moore's run on Swamp Thing, I know, I know, I'm getting into the geeky <sighs> side of my brain, but if you ever look at Alan Moore's run on Swamp Thing, there is a, a, a beautiful way that he manages to turn it around on the creature, and you realise this creature is a human being underneath and always will be. Yeah. Um, I, de- I never got the, the sense of that and they probably weren't even trying to capture that to be fair that's just something that I'm reading into it but um, the revelation of Don Ramon being the monster not a particular surprise to me I have to say no me neither me neither um, and but it's a surprise to everyone else um, as as they're kind of running around the island but it all sort of culminates doesn't it In I'll be honest with you towards the end I'm starting to lose track of a few things like there's a there's a tribe of people there who are after Bill and Sheila and I can't remember why mm-hmm. things like that so it it starts to get maybe it's because I was starting to turn off by that point in in my head you know it, it just really wasn't gripping me um but yeah, yeah I'm starting to lose track of of why things are happening towards the end yeah, it ba- essentially it all culminates in, in a showdown at the lab, the secret labs that belong to Dr. Lorca, and Bill's managed to find his way there. Carlos has been has been uh, kidnapped by Dr. Lorca at that point, and he sort of comes in and he sees that there are a bunch of other natives down there who all are exhibiting signs of, of, uh, of this poisoning, if you like. They've got some of the green starting to show on their faces and everything, but they haven't fully transformed and you know in comes Dr Lorca and his assistant there who he sort of gets to do all of his dirty work for him and they have a little fight and the, the great thing about Bill Foster is played by what was his name John Ashley he's got the uh, I don't know if you noticed it, noticed it he's got the Captain Kirk fighting style <laughs> where it's all definitely. where it's all karate chops and uh, <laughs> putting your hands together like a, axe handle almost like a, exactly yeah yeah like an axe handle and whacking them on the back like it was quite <laughs> It was uh, it was cheering me up to see that. I guess that must have been the '60s style fighting. Um, if you're an American, but I, I I really enjoyed looking at that. And then there's a essentially what we're all leading to is is Don Ramon getting revenge on uh, Doctor Lorca, who who made him this way. Uh, but prior to this, we'd seen, of course, a scene where Marla, who's the young girl, had had an affair with Don Ramon many years ago. He's quite a bit older than her. Uh, he, uh, she says in the film, you know, he took me when I was fourteen, which is like that's a big no no, but you know, um, in any case, that's what he did, and she never loved another man since then. Even though she was flirting with Carlos quite a bit, well, she had sex with Carlos, didn't she? Uh, she had sex with him, yeah, exactly. Mm. So sexual intercourse, Tom. So it, it's you know, it, it it makes me wonder why she did that and why she was being so flirty with him. What did she really want? I, I know it never quite made clear to me exactly what it was she wanted from him because. You know, she had sex with. She was very flirtatious at the beginning, and then a bit standoffish, and then had sex with him, and then standoffish again. If her true love was always Don Ramon, you know, I don't know. Maybe she had sex with him because he was the son of the man she loved. I don't know. It's a bit weird, isn't it? But possibly, possibly. But while we're on the subject yeah. as well, you know, we've um, Bill and Sheila, a boyfriend oh. and girlfriend, and you know, Sheila, to be honest, just sort of totters into every scene, looking. She's she reminds me of when they get like a thirty five year old to play a high school girl, you know <laughs> she she's starting to look a little bit weathered around the gills, but you know they try they'd really try and glam them up, um, and her and Bill have a, a scene as well, and she's this busty woman with a big bouffante hairstyle, and she's laying back there, and the way they've got the fr- the shot framed and the way Bill sort of undresses it it's almost as if to say you've been waiting to see her boobs this whole film haven't you <laughs> well yeah. here you go <laughs> it's yeah. just sort of, just, ta-da. <laughs> very much so and according to a piece of feedback we get later on um this that was an unsimulated sex scene 
originally when they shot it, they re- really were having sex. And apparently, no way. Uh, according to the actress who, who played she, her name is Angelique Pettijohn. According to her, anyway, and according to this piece of feedback as well, it's all according to because mm. I never actually, you know, we don't do the trivia section on here anymore to to save us a bit of time here. Uh, but apparently, that was unsimulated. And then, for whatever reason, they they must have cut it down to make it non-explicit when they they came to cut the film together. But yeah, apparently, it was unsimulated to begin with. Hmm. Mm-hmm. There you go, Tom. We could have seen a little bit of pornography to make make our little wangers flutter with delight, but it it, it it wasn't to be. But yeah, they had and they had a sex scene when they were like being chased by a monster and stuff. I mean, it's not it's not the ideal time, is it? Really, it's not. But if you're gonna die, you know, you might as well. Try gonna, and, yeah. You know. It's, if you're going to do it, whack one in, Tom. That's what I always say. That's my motto. Is if you if you and I were at a zombie apocalypse, and we knew we were going to die. I'd definitely give you a good old finger in. Thanks, mate. Welcome. So at the end, they discover this sort of underground lair, don't they? And all hell breaks loose. You got people running everywhere. Suddenly, I think Bill said, or is it Marla, the young girl, mm-hmm. or Bill? I can't remember which one says. The lab's on fire just the moment before it's on fire. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then fire kind of sweeps in from left to right. And I think they've they've poured a line of some, some flammable fluid across the front of the set. And they go, the lab's on fire. And then throw a match <laughs> on it and it goes whoo, across the screen. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It never, it never, it didn't particularly look like the lab was on fire. More like just a, a little stretch of the floor was on fire. But fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. And and yeah, uh, Doctor Lork is in there, of course, trapped with uh, the monster Don Ramon, and he uh, bashes him to death mm. uh, with a couple of good monster karate chops. And uh, and Marla's sort of watching it, and she slides down the wall, watching it. And you, you know, of course, you're meant to believe that they both perish in there. Along with the fire, because everybody else manages to get out except for Doctor Lorca, his his assistant as well, who's knocked out, knocked clean out by a good punch to the face from old Bill. And so, but the the good characters manage to get out. The natives are rescued. Carlos is rescued. Bill and Sheila are there. And there's a big explosion down in the labs, and and they're all dead in there. Mm. And you're thinking, right, that is the end of that. A job well done. Do 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 do. I'm just um, making the sound there of you know dusting your hands off. Like there you go. We're done, and they get on the boat and they sail away to pastures new. Or do they, Tom? Or do they? Well, I think Carlos has got something to worry about because when that sea captain comes out, he gives him a look like <laughs> he does. Oh, well, you know, he does, doesn't he? Yeah, he looks like. Oh, would you like a little bit of it? And you know what, Tom? It's been a hard day, and sometimes you can be your weaknesses can be exploited, and uh, it's possible he laid with that man. And they made sweet, sweet love. There's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely not. No. If that's uh, if that's what he wants to do, that's great. But unfortunately, they might not get to do that <laughs> because there is someone stowed away on the um, in the boat. I wasn't quite sure who it was in the lifeboat there, but I'm, I couldn't tell. Was that green blood? I assume it was. It, yeah, it was. Well, I mean, if we look at the plot of, I haven't written it down, but if we look at the plot of the next film in the series, which is Beast, uh, which is Beast of Blood. Um, it looks like what well, I mean. This is going to be spoilers for the next one, but it's not on the section three list, so we won't be talking about it anyway. It looks like the next film follows directly on from this, and essentially, the boat ends up getting destroyed by the monster that is inside the boat, and that is Doctor Lorca. Ah, yeah. So it seems like yeah, that's Doctor Lorca, and it is quite funny because I was reading the synopsis of, of the next one and. The only person who survives the boat being destroyed is uh, Bill Foster. And he comes back to Blood Island and he finds another woman on there and they make sweet, sweet love. So (laughs) there you go. So he's not particularly precious about his women, Tom. He'll, you know, if one goes, another one follows. Well, that that was the time, you know. Apparently they they, they did drop like flies in those days. So you have to just move on. If you're on Blood Island, Tom, you're gonna get what you get. You got to get what you're gonna get. Mm. At the end of the day, I would have to say. So, what do you think of this overall, Tom? You know, it's probably a bit more fun to talk about than it was to watch. Um, but mm. it, you know, it, like you said earlier on, it wasn't offensively bad. It's not like one of the ones that's been on this list so far, where you just sit there and you want to die. It's just, um, you know, I, I think someone could probably cut it down to about 40 minutes of cheese that would probably be quite fun to watch, but 
of an hour and a half, just a bit too long for me. Yeah, I think, you know, sort of about an hour and 15 minutes, somewhere around there. You know, 70, 75 minutes, I think would it would have been... Yeah, it might have been a bit tighter, and but there are a couple of places where it's pretty spirited, and it's just a it's a super B movie. Mm. It's like we said, could fit in with the ones from the fifties if it was black and white. It really could. It's that sort of thing, and it's trashy and it's super cheesy, and the monsters a bit crap, and the acting's a bit crap. But it you know it's it's all right. It's like I said, it's a bad movie, but it's not. It wasn't offensively bad. One of those things. Like when I finished it, I was like, you know what? Glad to have seen it, so I can talk about it with Tom. And we can hear some of the opinions from from the listeners, but it's not one I would ever watch again, um, no. not by any stretch of the imagination. But hey, I give them credit, you know, Filipino horror. They're giving it a good old go, and um, it, it's it's all right, it's all right. And what more can you say? Absolutely. So um, you mentioned earlier on the sequel and so on, which probably ties in quite nicely to the release information, doesn't it? It certainly does, Tom. You've been looking at that document, haven't you? You've been looking at that document and you know what's uh, set to come. We're well, absolutely right. Uh, Cinema Club released a Region 2 DVD in the UK under the title Mad Doctor of Blood Island, which is uh, the title we watched it under, uh, under their cult collection marquee. Now, I said it before, that's the one that I've got. And I remember getting a, a little box set of films that had that in it. Maybe even had some of the sequels. I, I just don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not sure, but... Um, that was in there. Uh, Alpha New Cinema released a now out of print region free DVD of the film. When I say out of print, it was up there for like one hundred and thirty dollars. So you probably not want to spend that much on this. Um, as well as uh, the two other installments in the Blood Island trilogy. So it's Brides of Blood. That was the first one. The Mad Doctor of Blood Island, and then Beast of Blood. Now the latter, as I said, was a direct sequel to Mad Doctor. These can also be picked up as part of the Blood Island Vacation Collection, which adds Brain of Blood alongside the original trilogy. Now, as far as I can tell, any other films in the series after Beast are pretty much just sort of hanging on to the to the name of the original. Even even these three, they're like Brides of Blood and, and Mad Doctor are sort of loosely connected. Right, because it's got John Ashley in 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 all three of them, but in the in the first one he's playing a different character to the one he plays in in the next two. So, oh. you know, a bit of a loose connection. But and I'm not sure that Brain of Blood has anything to do with the story of of these three. But you can get all four of them together if your if your heart desires such a thing, Tom. Okay, okay. Well, I don't think yours does. I don't think I'll be picking them up anytime soon. But uh, <laughs> thanks for the information. <laughs> no, but good. You know, good to see something. Good to see something we've not seen before. We can yeah, and, we can say that much about and it. And something where we just didn't want to claw our eyes out from watching it because it's been a lot of shit lately, hasn't it? Exactly, and there's no rape in it, which, quite frankly, uh, may have been one of the reasons why we stopped recording for a while because we needed to catch our breaths from the nastiness of all that. Well, look, Tom, that was the Mad Doctor of Blood Island, but there's another film here. We always do a double bill, don't we? So why don't you tell us all about the next film? Well, this one's called Massacre Mansion, and it was released in 1976, the year I was born. And it, it's also known as The Terror of Dr. Cheney, Mansion of the Doomed, and House of Blood. Directed by Michael Pataki, and starring Richard Basehart, Gloria Graham, Trish Stewart, and our old fave Lance Henriksen, among there others. There he is. Yeah. Okay, well... This film goes like this. Dr. Leonard Cheney is a desperate man, clearly tired and feeling the strain of the situation he's in. The film begins with a nightmare showing him gouging his fingers into the eyes of a patient. He's haunted, yet determined to set things right. We learn that Leonard and his daughter Nancy were involved in a car accident, as Leonard swerves the car to avoid a dog. The crash sends shards of glass shooting out, blinding Nancy in the process. Now that she cannot see, she simply sits at home, sad and unwilling to live life. Leonard cannot stand it, so he's been working on solutions, exploring the idea of a transplant that might be able to restore her sight. Each time he thinks of an idea, it seems to be squandered by the possibility of damage or failure, and Dr. Cheney cannot accept failure. The idea hits Leonard one evening after a chat with his wife Catherine, He's decided to do a complete eye transplant, but in order to do it, they need the eyes of the living, not those taken from animals or from the deceased. He sets a plan in motion, inviting Nancy's prospective boyfriend Dan around for dinner. Catherine spikes his drink, which later knocks him out completely. 
Leonard and Catherine perform the transplant at home and Nancy wakes up and can see again. Leonard is overjoyed and leaves Nancy by the pool to enjoy a swim while he goes to work, content that he's made a medical breakthrough. Sadly for Leonard and Nancy and Dan too, the blindness soon returns. Leonard believes it's an issue with infection and that, on and that the only solution is to try the transplant again with another set of eyes. And so begins Leonard's descent into madness as he searches for victim after victim, removing their eyes and leaving them locked up in a cell in the basement. He keeps them trapped but alive, believing that once he's found the solution to Nancy's blindness, he'll be able to restore their sight as well. A group of victims is soon gathered with Dan and some of the others scraping a hole in the wall through which they hope to escape. Leonard's constant surgeries on Nancy are having a horrible effect on her face and the transplants sim simply aren't taking. With Catherine becoming more and more frightened of the road they're going down and Leonard stubbornly refusing to give up, it seems the true road to freedom lies with the blind group in the basement as they prepare to fight back. Oh. Mm. All their new theories that lead to dead ends. Len, why don't you talk it over with your colleagues? I can't just wait for somebody to hand me the solution. I've been thinking about that uh, Irish doctor. What's his name? Um, Doran. Doran, yeah. Now, his concept comes closest to being the best. His idea is to transplant the cornea from one live element to another, and he's done just that with animals. An animal cornea can be transplanted into a human? No, no, no. Now, the secret is something else. A live element transplanted into another, yes, yes, yes. But not just the cornea. It wouldn't help in Nancy's case. It could be the entire eye. But... She's, she's blind, Lynn. Nancy is going to have her sight back. Gal, I don't appreciate your pessimism. That's not fair. Oh, I'm sorry, Kathy. After her mother died, I, if you wouldn't come along, I don't know how I'd have raised her. Transplant the entire eye. That would destroy the optic nerve. How do we know it won't work? Unless I try. All right, Chris, Massacre Mansion, what do you think of this one? Well, it's an interesting film. It's quite good, I think, in a lot of different ways. Uh, some flaws there, quite tedious in places, I would say. It doesn't quite... It doesn't quite get there, you know, it doesn't quite get there, but it. But we're heading in the right direction with it, I think. I was quite surprised, you know, I watched it after The Mad Doctor of Blood Island, and there's definitely a difference in terms of quality. I mean, the director of this film, Michael Pataki, was an actor himself, um, somebody who'd been in, in quite a lot of stuff, really. Um, I, I would suppose for our audience, except for Amanda, of course, Amanda Reyes from, from Made for TV Mayhem, who knows every actor on TV and knows everything <laughs> they've ever been in, yeah. um, and, and fancies about 50% of them. Um, she would know his work probably quite extensively, but I would say for, for for you and I and for people of our ilk, not that not that Amanda isn't of our ilk, but you know what I mean. Somebody who's who's more of a layman when it comes to knowing some of these some of these character actors, it, we would know him best as the the goofy principal from Graduation Day. Do you remember that slasher that we covered? He was in there way back was when. He? Yeah, he was the goofy, he was one of the red herrings in it. You know, you're supposed to think a bunch of these characters could be the killer. And he was the head the head teacher who was always having that sort of goofy, goofy relationship with his assistant. Ah. That was him. And that he's the, the one who directed this. So an interesting thing is a guy who, who starred in some horror and actually d directed one of his own. Uh, and... And yeah, I think I think a lot of this film really is is centered around Richard Basehart, who is the uh, the 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 main character in it, Doctor Leonard Cheney. Uh, of course, Cheney a reference in itself, oh, yeah. um, a fair, fairly obvious one. And I think it, I mean he's somebody who's been around for a long, 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 long time. Uh, had been starring in the film in in film since the forties, really. So he's a, a pretty well known character actor, I would say, and and is the lead here and. I think does a pretty good job, really, of, of sort of tying everything together. 
of making you b- believe that this person is not it doesn't want to be a bad person but is doing something out of love for his daughter and unfortunately is is on that descent into madness because of it doesn't know where to draw that line so i think it, it is you know i i think it's a it's a decent film i think it's it's it is good but it's it's a it's a bit tedious unfortunately for me so it doesn't quite get up there into being you know one of the best films we've seen since we've been you know films like christmas evil for example it's not quite up there but but throughout it, I was thinking there are moments here where it's it's getting there, you know. Mm. I um I can see where you're coming from. I, I Ooh, really can. There's descent in the ranks. Descent in the ranks. Not not as much as you think. I I actually think okay. I, I like it a bit more than you. Okay. But you know, is it a diamond in the section three rough? I think it's more of a an emerald or a bit of a ruby or something, because it, mm-hmm. it's. You're right. It's not quite there, but I I never got the tedious part personally because I really just liked watching Richard Basehart get himself deeper and deeper into shit <laughs> and seeing him unravel because you know he does it once. He thinks that's all he's got to cover up, but it doesn't work, so he's got to do it again and again and each time he's it's like spinning plates you know it's like something's something's got to give at some point you can't just keep doing it because each time he gets more and more sloppy um each time he kidnaps someone and takes their eyes he starts to take more and more risks and mm. i just really enjoyed watching that you know just this gradual unraveling because at the end of the day, the whole film is, is pretty much him getting another person, doing another operation, getting another person, doing another operation. So there's not a great deal of variance to it, but I just really enjoyed watching it. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, I can see where you're coming from with, because I think Jim Moon makes a bit of a comment that it's a bit slow for him as well later on. Um, mm. But I guess if something works for you, then you can gloss over that and this just really worked for me i i really dug this one quite a bit yeah i mean i think it's you mentioned something there that i think is perhaps the crux of the issue for me is that there there is a lack of variation in that we're basically through most of it seeing exactly the same thing happen Mm. Uh, now one of the good things about it is of course as, as you said we begin to see him unraveling as it's happening so he's getting more and more desperate and like you say making mistakes so in that respect yes but i do think that there's a very there's a lack of variation in that basically what we're seeing is just a succession of of shots of him capturing somebody doing the operation and then we see them get taken into the basement group and into that cell they've got in there and then we spend a little bit of time with them and then we go back to it and we do it all again mm. Um, I think that there's a weakness in the fact that his his daughter Nancy um, is sidelined at one point and is almost kind of forgotten about until the end of the film. Um, I think that's a bit of a problem because, especially since the whole thing is kind of rooted on rooted in his love for her, I would have liked to have seen I think more of more of her reaction to having to undergo these operations constantly. Um, we don't really see much of that, but I think. I think the core of it is is a really good thing, and yeah, I'm not going to pretend that you know. I think maybe you did like it a little bit more than me, but that more than me. But that's not to say I didn't like it. I, yeah. I did, and I thought it was a you know a, much stronger than a lot of the films we've we've seen on this list. Um, I like I say, I just think because there was a lack of that variation, it settled a little bit too much for me, uh-huh. where it should have really kind of kept rolling, and and I would have liked to see a change in the way that things were done a little bit. But but what an interesting concept for a film, you know? It's um. Never, I've not really seen a film like this before, to be honest with you. The idea of, you know, I wasn't expecting it, but the idea of this man taking these eyes and, and not actually wanting to be a murderer, not actually wanting to kill people and discard their bodies, but in this sort of vain hope that he can he can give them their sight back too. And of course, when you actually you think about the logics, that the, you know, the logical nature of it, it's like. Well, this isn't going to work. This is in order for you to restore their sight, you're going to have to take somebody else's sight. So it's never going to work, uh, Dr. Cheney. You're always going to leave somebody blind, unfortunately. <laughs> but, it, you know, it's sort of, it's a noble cause to some degree as well, as twisted as it may be. And I really enjoyed the the 
you know, that aspect of him leaving all these victims alive and they're down in that cell and they're, you know, the uh, the character of Dan played by Lance Henriksen is, uh, this is an early Lance Henriksen, of course, before he did, um, I think this is a, only a couple of years before he did Alien. Uh, sorry, he wasn't in Alien, he was in Aliens. Um, my apologies, but, um, but I would say this was before he, he became a, you know, sort of big B-movie icon. Um, and he's down there and he sort of tried, it, as more and more people fill up the cell, people who've, uh, who uh, Dr. Cheney has captured, um, he's it's trying to sort of encourage them and keep them strong. And I sort of enjoyed that group mentality of these people being shot and, and they, you know, they've lost their sight, but they're trying to band together as best they can to deal with the situation at hand. And I, I really enjoyed that part. We've got Gloria Graham in it, who plays his, um, his wife, who we last saw in The Nesting, which was a, uh, a film that I seem to remember us both not liking that much i can't really remember yeah, that much about right. it yeah but she was in that and she was in something else as well which I, I read about earlier on but i can't remember what it was now but it's it's something you would know um interesting film interesting film and like i say it, it, it didn't quite hit it for me but it's it's one of the better films that we've seen since we've been doing this without without a shadow of a doubt there's some some quality stuff in here yeah i i just think it is i mean you touched on it earlier it's such a great hook you know, he's he does it initially for the best reasons, and you think, what a strange choice he chooses. Um, he chooses Lance Henriksen to do the operation on. He drugs him and takes his eyes, and you're like, why did, why did he take his eyes? Why didn't he go mm. and get a homeless person or or something like that? And it is an odd choice, I suppose. I'm I'm guessing the reason must be that, you know, if he's going to do this then he needs to take him out of the way a bit as well um, because he's going to be checking on the daughter. I'm, I don't know. It's Well, he, he seemed to have some sort of rivalry did, with him, didn't he, in the in the very early scenes. It seemed like they were at odds with each other about how the eye operation should have taken place. I almost wonder if that was him sort of saying, OK, well, you don't believe that I can do it, so I'm going to do it on you. <laughs> That's That was my what I took away from it. Mm, possibly, possibly, maybe a bit of a grey area there that, that you know, we don't really know why he chose him. But um, you mentioned as well that uh, Nancy was it her name, Nancy, the daughter. Yes, it was. Yeah. Sort of gets sidelined now. I don't mind so much because if you're listening to this and you haven't seen the film and you're not going to because you just watch listen to the podcast and I do that with some podcasts. Mm-hmm. Um. What happens is Nancy gets Lance Henriksen's eyes and they work for a while, but then uh, she loses her sight again. So he tries, you know, he then starts kidnapping people off the street. He advertises for jobs for a carer, you know, and then takes the one of the applicant's eyes, all kinds of things like this. But Nancy, can, it's at this point that Nancy sort of gets sidelined, which I don't mind because there comes a point when you see Nancy again after all these operations and her eyes are just a mess of scar tissue around them. Mm. And yeah. they, they're getting her to, I think they're going to take her for one more operation and she just she just says, I don't care anymore. You know, yeah. they've... In trying to help her, they've put her through such an ordeal as well. All this pain of all these operations, taking her eyes out, putting them back in. And and I thought that was quite a powerful moment. So I, I didn't mind so much that she disappears for a while because when she comes back, it's like, look what they've done to her. This is horrible. I think that's a fair comment. I you know, And I don't think it... I don't think it's too detrimental to the film overall. You know, I, I just think that... I think I would have liked to have seen a bit more of that process of of how he does it. You know, I mean, we know obviously he gives her a sedative, but I would have liked to have seen how he was able to kind of justify these constant operations because she goes through a lot of them. I mean, I can't remember how many people are in that cell at the end, but it's what seven, eight, nine, maybe yeah, something like that. People who were down in there, so she's been through the operation a lot, and and I always wondered how. I would, I think, I would have liked to have seen more, maybe a few more conversations between father and daughter where there was that. Well, we could have seen a little bit more of what you were saying there, where she says, I don't even care anymore, because obviously she's in pain, there's the scar tissue. She hasn't even seen what she looks like. 
um, since the first operation. I think I would have liked to have seen a bit more of that because what it does for me is it, it renders the character moot, uh, you know, sort of moot ultimately. In that she's there in the beginning, and because we, we never explained, I mean, we kind of explained it in the synopsis, obviously. But it, he, Leonard is really the cause of his daughter's blindness because he's the one who swerves the car early on to avoid hitting the dog, and they have that crash, and the glass comes in and obviously takes her sight. And you get that, and I think brilliantly played by Richard ba- Basehart here, you really get the sense that he feels ma- massive amounts of guilt over it, and really feels like, you know. Um, he is the cause of it and thus is on this sort of this passionate and somewhat dangerous pursuit to to rectify the situation i think that is all played very well i think for me personally that you know it's just it's just i think something i would have liked to have seen in there just an an addition to it to have made to have to have cemented the relationship between the two of them a little better i think because after a certain point it just becomes really about leonard a little bit about um his wife i can't remember what her name was catherine a little bit about her and you get you know obviously you get this the sense from her that she is beginning to regret what's happening and is beginning to regret that they took you know people off the streets and and that you know, she can see that her husband is is descending into madness, and um, it, the focus is not on the daughter anymore. Now, like you say, that doesn't take away from the fact that the impact later on of seeing all this scar tissue on her face and and what happens towards the end of the film, I think, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's 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 too detrimental to the film. It's just something that I I think I would have liked to to have seen a bit more. But I did enjoy the the chemistry, really chemistry of sorts between the group, the you know, the blind group down in the basement, because it's a it's a it's a dangerous situation. I I felt very conflicted through the movie because I didn't know whether to dislike Cheney. Do, do I feel sorry for him? I mean, where do you go with it? Uh, it's a tough one because he, you know, he's probably lived his whole life as a good man who's never done anything wrong. You know, mm. got a nice family home there. He's a doctor, and it, it's it's out of love for his daughter and guilt for what he's done, and it's. It's interesting that we spoke about the lack of magnetism with our last Mad Doctor, and I think this one repaid it in spades for me because this I couldn't take my eyes off him, and it's a it's a no pun intended. It's um it's a performance that he is slightly big and slightly theatrical in his delivery, you know, mm-hmm. but. I just really enjoyed that about it. I think it fitted quite well. Um, so I, I just thought he was great. Richard Basehart, he had the magnetism that uh, Dr. Um, I can't even remember his name from the last one. Um, Dr. Lorca, was it? Lorca, yeah. 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 He, Cheney has the magnetism that he didn't have. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, in those moments of... You know, you mentioned the the slower moments. I I think it's him that kind of carries me through, just watching him and what he does in it. Right. Are you sure you're not just attracted to old bearded blokes? Moustached blokes, remember? Didn't he have a beard? No, he had a moustache, didn't he? He had a moustache, did he? Yeah. How did I miss that? That's like, that's our thing. I know. As well, how did I miss that? I know. I was too too busy looking at my own bell end, Tom. (laughs) No, but it, um, no, I, th- I think it definite magnetism and, and much more of a of the sort of you know if you like the typical mad doctor kind of character. I, I have to say, you know, some of the feedback bears this out as well. The inner monologuing kind of stuff is I don't know that it always worked for me. I mean, there are, there are quite a few points in the film where I couldn't understand what he was saying because it was that whole <sighs> you know that sort of gravelly whisper- voice, doesn't it? Yeah, gravel- gravelly and a little bit low, and I couldn't really, I couldn't quite work out what he was saying a couple of times in the film, but. But definitely, you know, the, the we, we do like our character-driven films, we, both of us jointly, I think, like the, the types of films where it's it's one character who's just losing their mind throughout the film. And this definitely, so I don't think it's as good as some of the other ones that, that we've seen, you know, Maniac and Christmas Evil films like that. But it, it's, it, but it, I, I think it, it, it is, you know, I think it, it's a really commendable performance. And I'm actually struggling to think if I've seen Richard Basehart in anything, certainly not nothing to where I was specifically looking for him. Um, and I feel like I've probably missed out on some really good stuff because it's very clear that he's talented at what he does and he's skilled. He's a skilled actor, and and um, I enjoyed him. Yeah, magnetism is the word. I think definitely keeps this going, ticking over, and you want to know what's going on. But I was also invested, like I say, in the in the group downstairs and in Lance Henriksen's character and them trying to get out and 
there is an escape, isn't there? They've been sort of scraping away at this hole in the uh, in the wall, and they manage to send one of the girls on through, and she gets caught very very quickly. Yeah, but they they got a little backup, and, and I wonder whether that was the plan. We'll send one out as a kind of decoy, and then send another one out, or was it just a case of let's get as many people as we can out? I don't know because one gets caught and the other makes it further, doesn't she? Yeah, but not not far enough, unfortunately, because <laughs> um, she ends up getting run over by a car, and then that starts the police investigation what there is of it because i was thinking well this is obviously how it's all going to get torn down is that the the this detective comes in he ends up kind of uh pulling this whole thing apart but actually it doesn't happen that way really it, it all comes apart because of nancy and we go back to her don't we that's right and um, this is when we meet her again and she's had well actually but we should say prior to that you know catherine of course who is lena's wife has been having misgivings about the whole thing and she's standing near the cell and one of the guys who um, who's in there grabs her and chokes her to death and kills her. And of course, uh, grief is not Leonard's strong point um, because he immediately <laughs> takes her eyes and gives them to Nancy. Yeah. And, you know, we see Nancy wake up out of bed later on. And that seems to have worked temporarily, albeit, but it seems to have worked and she can see again. And she manages to sort of stumble on down to the basement and sees all of these people there and realises very, very quickly exactly what her father's been doing. And um, Good revelation there. And I think things really pick up the pace at this point. And I was really quite you know, captivated by what's... I was wondering, what's going to happen? Like, Is Leonard going to get away with this? Do I want him to get away with it? I don't, I don't think I do, but you know, I don't hate the man. I can understand why he's been doing what, what he's doing. It gets quite tense, I think, towards the end. It does. There's a good, good bit of run around. I mean, and you see how far... Uh, Dr. Cheney's fell. When the detective comes around, he, he's got a little trademark way of killing people, hasn't he? Or or sedating yeah. them, sorry. You know, if McFarlane made the figure of Dr. Cheney the way they always <laughs> did with all the, the killers, he would have a glass of wine because he's always like, would you like a glass of wine? And then they, <laughs> yeah. you know, they, um, they go unconscious and he scoops their eyes out. And he, he even tries to do that with the detective near the end. Um, but yeah, it's it's a bit of a run around at the end, kind of people going here, there, and everywhere. Um, quite a, a decent conclusion. Yeah, I enjoyed it. You know, I like the idea of of her of Nancy ultimately realizing what her father did and and not liking that, not accepting that, and coming down and helping them escape. Yeah, and they managed to trap poor old Dr. Cheney in the cell with one of the guys who's like more of a bruiser kind of character. He's one of the guys who, who gave chase to uh, Dr. Cheney earlier on in the film. Because we completely forgot about this, by the way, but it, just to go back before we sort of finish off that, um, there is a, a scene that I found quite uncomfortable in this. Do you know what scene I mean? Yeah, yeah, definitely. With the do, child. you know what I mean? The, the child, yeah. There's At one point he thinks, you know, all these different transplants have failed. So he thinks, well, maybe I'll take the eyes of a child, you know, sort of young and fresh and... And that will work. And he finds this little girl sitting on a wall and she's reading a book. Mm. And even though Dr. Cheney is, is not a child molester or anything of the sort, you know, it's a really, really uncomfortable moment because he's trying to he's trying to convince this girl to get into the car with him and manages to do so. Uh, but it is a child molestery move. Definitely. And and it was like, oh, I don't know, this is this is it. Never mind all the eye, all the eye stuff and the eye gore. This is the part that's making me the most uncomfortable because I realise that this happens, yeah. um, and I know I found that a bit terrifying to be honest, Tom. Definitely, because he's quite a charming man when he, you know, he's not gouging people's eyes out, um, and just the way he sort of, uh, oh, you like Disney World? I'm going to Disney World later. Yeah, and just how easily he does it. But anyway, zooming right back to the end of the film here, we, um, Doctor Cheney, poor Doctor Cheney is, is uh, captured now in the cell. And the reason I brought that up, the the little girl, was also to say that two guys saw him trying to take the girl away, and they give chase to him, and he ends up, you know, taking their eyes out, sedating them, and taking their their eyes out using the wine, as you mentioned before. And he, one of those guys, is the one that grabs Doctor Cheney and gouges his eyes out, and and. Gouges and pulls them right out, yeah, and leaves uh, 
Dr. Cheney screaming. Nice little bit of gore there, which of course we didn't mention, Tom, because uh, probably because I didn't write it down here as part of trivia or anything. That the special effects in this were done by Stan Winston. Mm, Credited as Stanley Winston, I think. <laughs> Credited as Stanley Winston, yeah. And, you know, not necessarily the best work he's done, but still pretty good. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's, um, I mean, it's a Charles Band movie, isn't it? And I think back yeah. in those days, he. He did have a knack for making movies for not much money, but making them look better than, you know, what could usually be expected, I think. Because, you know, the way, I mean, you know, Lloyd Kaufman generally makes films that look shit, but that's part of their charm, you know what I mean? Whereas Charles Band, at least early on, you know, uh, managed to do things that look better than the money that was spent on them um, and I think this is this is one of them it's not you know hugely cinematic but if you went to video shop and picked this up I, I think you'd probably be quite happy with it yeah I think it's good and this was before I think this was before Charles Band had full 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 moon pictures put together I don't know for sure mm. on that but this was but really before he kind of came became popular with films like Trancers and um, which I saw for the first time very recently. Trance's Puppet Master, you know, Reanimator films like that. Uh, so, so yeah, interesting. Actually, I don't know if Reanimator is a is a full moon pictures one. No, I'll have to, no, um, it's not. No, I don't think it is, is it? No, but uh, but I know Richard Band did the soundtrack. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of on that. But uh, but yeah, no, it's um, commendable effort on this. Commendable effort on this. And Michael Pataki, uh, I think, did a reasonably. You know, it's got the air of a maybe of a TV movie about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but with you know, with some nastiness in it that you wouldn't see on TV. No. I think it's fair to say. Uh, you know, like we say, Lance Henriksen's in this. Before really kind of broke through as the the, the B-movie actor we know him to be now. And certainly, you know, in Aliens, of course, is probably his most famous role, I would imagine. Uh, Pumpkinhead films like that. Before he really broke out. But, you know, so he's in this and he's in a fair amount of it, but not by no means the main character. The main character here is Dr. Leonard Cheney, played by Richard Basehart. And a very good performance it is, too. I, uh, you know, to sum up, I just, I don't know. I think it just speaks to me in a way that I, I can understand other people not being that much into it, but sometimes something just strikes a chord within you, doesn't it? And I think mm-hmm. this does it with me. So, yeah, probably one of the higher ones on the list for me. Strikes your maniac chord, mate. You're absolutely <laughs> mental. Uh, no, I, I agree. I liked it. I thought it was a good film. Uh, definitely one of the better ones we've, we, you know, if we're going to compile a little list of, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, well, you know, whatever, <laughs> however many films we choose to select that are actually, you know, and we may even do that towards the end. I'm not sure we may pick the kind of the best, the best and the worst, but this would definitely be in the best pile. I think it's, you know, like I say, it's not up there for me with films like um, Christmas Eve or, but I think it's, it, it's pretty good. And if it wasn't, you know, like I say, a little bit dull for me in places, which it wasn't for you and that's fair. Uh, but overall, it's a it's a it's a good work. It's a good work, and I'm glad to have seen it. And and uh, and yeah, yeah. Richard Basehart, good man, good man indeed. Plays a good ma- mad doctor, I think. Yes, yes. Okay. Well, uh, there's a, a few releases knocking around of this. A couple at least, because I, I had a bit of trouble getting hold of it. But what what have you uncovered on that front? Well, I've only got a couple of little basic bits here. Um, Full Moon Features released a region free DVD. Uh, in America under the title uh, Mansion of the Doomed. There's also a Region 2 DVD released here in the UK under the same title from Digital Entertainment. Um, There's a review on Amazon that suggests that the picture quality on this is really poor. Um, That's the only two releases that I found very quickly. What have you got? Well, I got the Digital Entertainment one, but you see, when when I was trying to find these two films, because there's a few different titles for them, I was start, I was getting confused with which one was which and everything. And mm-hmm. some of some of these Mansion of the Dooms can go for you know a few quids, but then in other places they'll cost nothing, you know. So you really got to shop around for this one if you indeed want it at all. My one's gone on eBay soon. I didn't like it that much, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> you see that? That's when we get to the crux of it, Tom. Which is like, this is a bit of a oh, this is a bit of a ruby or an emerald. This really speaks to me. <laughs> you can buy it from me on eBay in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, no, but it, it's. I mean, the, you know, obviously I uh, um, shared your copy, um, and uh, it didn't look that bad to me. No, um, it's all right. 
you know, but I mean, I watched it on an iPad. I tend to watch most of these on an iPad unless it's something I own on Blu-ray or it's something that demands maybe more of a sort of cinematic kind of viewing. But um, yeah, it didn't look that bad. Uh, but yeah, there you go. That's the end of that. That was Mansion of the Doomed or Massacre Mansion, Terror of Dr. Cheney, whatever it may be. Um, and that's the end of our double bill, isn't it, Tom? It is, it is, and um, we've uh, we've had some feedback sitting in the vault for quite a while now, so shall we have a listen to some feedback? Let's do it, let's listen to some feedback. Zombie podcast. Hope you're well, gents. So let's talk two movies. First movie that I watched was Mad Doctor of Blood Island 1969. Overall, just a fun little, as you would expect, 60s monster type flick where Doctor creates zombies of green stuff and hilarity ensues. It's a fun movie. Characters are believable. Overacting is there. Everything you'd expect from something in the 1960s fun movie may never watch it again but you know overall it was probably about a you know 2.5 out of 5 for me thanks for that one really enjoyed it let's move on to the next one mansion of the dune this one almost reminded me of a tv movie that you would see in the 70s over here at the states um just you know bonkers crazy stuff all the way around has some real uh 80s stars for me richard basehart and Dick Tabak, uh, both appeared heavily in 80s uh, TV here in the States, and of course I noticed that the incomparable Lance Henriksen was in there as well. It did get a bit tedious towards the middle, but certainly the first half and most of the back half were exciting, fun, characters were very believable, Doctor going crazy was, was quite obvious, um, you know, he's got to thinking after a while, what is he going to do with all those bodies in the cage? I mean, he's got all these eyeballs, but he's also got a lot of live people. The escape scene was uh, great. A little bit of revenge in there as well. All in all, just kind of a, you know, a fun movie. Not sure I'd ever rewatch it again, but certainly, you know, it was even a, a bit better than Mad Doctor of Blood Island. Found the characters much more believable. The acting certainly on par with what one would think of from, you know, these, uh, you know, certainly some of the stalwarts that were in the movie. All in all, not a bad watch, although towards the middle, like I said before, I did find it to start to get tedious, but, the, you know, surprisingly, that turned around pretty quick. But anyways, again, thanks for uh, bringing this one out as well. Uh, both of them overall, uh, good, good fun movies. Not sure I'd ever watch them again. Um, you know, the Mad Doctor one certainly was more, to me, more comedy than anything. But, um, you know, the Mansion one certainly had a, you know, much more creepier feel um, compared to the first one. Thank you again, Tom and Chris, for bringing these out. Keep doing the work. I absolutely love it. it um, it's interesting to venture down your, your Section 3 list. And thank you for them not being rapey this time. Really appreciate it. Cheers. Hi again fellas, it's Andy Roberts with this week's feedback for Massacre Mansion and Tomb of the Living Dead. So starting with Massacre Mansion, the opening few scenes were a bit confusing due to the way it was edited. Lance Henriksen is in it, surprisingly, and Gloria Graham from the other section of Three Nasty, The Nesting, is here too. The eyeball surgery made me a little squirmy and the empty eye socket makeup is actually quite fun. The film then did a kind of lather, rinse, repeat of daughter losing sight, plucking another stranger's eyes out and using them. It was quite disturbing hearing Cheney's justification in his head, especially when he tries to lure an innocent child away. More disturbing still is the two witnesses allowing themselves to be bought off. I also started to wonder why Kathy was still helping him. She can't like him that much. One of the victims manages to escape, and the way she wanders around reminded me a bit of a shambling zombie. Regardless, I felt a bit disappointed that she was killed without getting help, and after receiving the bleak news, one of the victims manages to grab and choke Kathy into unconsciousness, while Cheney quips, There's no need for this! Is this guy for real? Especially since he takes Kathy's eyes and kills her. 
although I guess she deserved it due to her complacency and all that's transpired. The daughter also seems to have had enough of the constant surgery, and when she regains her eyesight temporarily, she releases the victims from the cellar. They entrap Cheney and take his eyes out non-surgically. Poetic justice, but I still think he deserved worse. I quite enjoyed this one. I find myself really rooting for the victims, and it was interesting, even if a little frustrating, to hear Cheney's inner monologues. The eyeball violence was probably why this was on Section 3. The DPP was probably still incensed over Fulci's eye-gouging scenes in the Section 2 titles, Zombie Flesh Eaters and uh, The Beyond. On to Tomb of the Living Dead. It starts with a hokey anachronism that hasn't really survived in modern cinema, audience participation. The action then starts straight away with some frenzied and quite nauseating camera zooms and music that sounds like Night of the Living Dead stock tracks. The zombie creature looks like a green slimy version of the skeletal undead from Andrea Bianchi's Burial Ground, but it is quite a unique look. Of course, in some shots it just looks like a large lump of mucus. The opening sounds like zombie flesh eaters, with a daughter travelling to a cursed island to find her father, who in this iteration would rather perv on a native girl swimming in a lagoon. Sheila, the daughter, gets chased by the monster, and starts to resemble an animated dessert in that 60s dress and that hair, especially when she just exhaustedly plops on the ground after running a few metres. Why does this ceremony to drive away bad spirits involve the world's tamest orgy? And further, why does it involve stabbing to death a bunch of restrained goats and pigs for real? The story's quite simple, but fun. Dr. Lorca is clearly behind the goings-on, having a cure for leukaemia using chlorophyll. The gore scenes are actually not bad either, including some disembowelment, decapitations, limb removal and stabbings with a lot of gusto. Lorca's lab looks straight out of a hammer picture, while the animated plant looks more comfortable in a Crash Bandicoot game. Sheila's sex scene with Foster is quite interesting, as the actress swears that it was unsimulated and more explicitly filmed, but that never made it into the final cut. It ends with a green-blooded hand appearing on the ship that our heroes use to get away, paving way for the many more sequels. I quite enjoyed this one too. The gore was surprisingly strong and the monster was pretty unique. The retitle of Tomb of the Living Dead looks like it was meant to exploit the producer's name, Eddie Romero, in order to link it with the Dead series and make it appear to be a similar zombie film. This, I think, put with the animal cruelty, is most likely what landed it on the Section 3 list. Well, I think that's about it, so I'll just uh, look forward to hearing your points on it. We've had an email from our old friend Amanda Reyes from Made for TV Mayhem and she says hi guys unfortunately I was only able to watch Mansion of the Doomed which is too bad because Mad Doctors can be a lot of fun and in the case of Mansion they really were so I was thrilled that I was finally able to see it. I remember a few episodes ago when you reviewed Blue Eyes of the Broken Doll I wrote that I really liked horror movies that explore grief, regret and sadness and I think Mansion, aside from its obvious ocular connection to Doll, ran very closely along those same lines, although far more overt since we follow the madman around in this, in this film. Richard Basehart, one of my favourite faces from my childhood. <laughs> she always does this, doesn't she? I can't she remember does, ever she? seeing him. But <laughs> no, it's like, I think she makes it up. I know, yeah. Just all these random actors she always knows everything they've done um, yeah either that or, or she always says you know oh and i saw that at the alamo draft house <laughs> in in uh 2004 and it's like no you didn't <laughs> they never showed that on the cinema screen you're mental but thank you okay Carry she on. says uh, <laughs> one of my favorite faces from my childhood uh, was excellent as the good doctor driven mad by the guilt he felt over causing his daughter's blindness. So much for that, his demented quest created a metaphoric blindness that shut out all that was obviously unethical about what he was doing. It was so well played and something that resonated with me. So sue me. Oh, she's bloody aggressive, isn't she? I know, yeah. So Blimey, she could make a good good dominatrix. We're not going to sue you, Amanda, <laughs> just because you no. like the film. Um, I haven't got any money, Tom. Uh, I wanted to mention that I read a re review of Mansion on a site called Apocalypse Later that called out something interesting about the film's visual setup. They described the main portion of the Doctor's house, the upstairs, as an old school mad Doctor setup with gorgeous interiors and full of upper class drama. 
well as they viewed the basement or downstairs as symbolic of the new 70s horror sensibilities, showcasing violence and sleazy grit. That critique falls in line with how I felt about Mansion's mix of classic stars like Baseheart, Vic <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, all Vic Tayback. Yeah, we all, we all know Vic Tayback, Tom. Oh God, I've Who got a shelf full Vic of Tayback? his movies up there. <laughs> Me too. He was in all the classics. I saw one of his films at the Alamo Draft House in uh, 2007. <laughs> Vic Tayback. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Who needed to be in at least 500 more scenes? I was thinking the same thing, Amanda. Yeah, I'm thinking so as well. Like, There's not enough Vic Tayback in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh okay and Gloria Graham with the new kids working behind the scenes new kids new kids on the block um, such as, could be. oh right sorry new kids working behind the scenes such as Charles Band Stan Winston and Andrew De- <laughs> <laughs> hold on uh, I'll start from new kids uh, hold on and the new kids work behind the scenes, such as Charles Band, Stan Winston, and Andrew Davis, who go on to direct the underrated slasher, The Final Terror. You're a fan of that one, aren't you, Chris? <laughs> I'm a big fan, Tom, of The Final Terror. I wish it wasn't the final one. I wish they'd made another one before the, mm. the final one. Uh, how could I not love its classy but sleazy sensibilities? It's like this movie was made for me. Yeah. <laughs> Also, I thought the director Michael Pataki, a well-known character actor in his own right, and probably most recognised by slasher fans as the principal in Graduation Day, as you said mm. earlier. I, I said that, yeah, that's a that's a reference from Amanda we recognise, yeah. <laughs> Seems rather confident behind the camera in his directorial debut. Yeah, it's a bit choppy, but the themes are striking. I do read a lot into low-budget horror for better or worse, but it makes viewing films more fun for me. Thanks for indulging me. You're welcome. I hope you enjoyed this one, but either way, I'm looking forward to your conversation about it. Finally, just a few words about Richard Basehart. This is more for Chris because he's mentioned he's an animal lover. Basehart was very known for his compassion for animals and he started the foundation in 1971 in Los Angeles called Actors for Animals, which Mm. helps those in need pay for their pet's care amongst other worthy causes. The foundation still exists and Basehart remains the face of the organisation. Is he dead or still alive? Um, I think he's gone. Yeah, I think he's away. He was pretty. He was getting on a bit. Um, yeah, yeah. Even in even in this, yeah, well, this I think he died in the in the eighties. Yeah. Forty years ago, so he'd have to be right. like a hundred or something. Like that. <laughs> yeah, um, it's one of the many things I love about him. That doesn't surprise me. No, also, seeing him and Vic Tayback <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in the same yeah, room me too. together. Oh yeah. my god, 70s character actor perfection. I know, I was thinking exactly the same thing. I was like, the the scenes that really crackle in this are the ones where he's in the same room as Vic Tayback. Yeah, I was thinking Baseheart and Tayback together at last. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. No, fantastic. A, a tour de force. <laughs> Take care, Amanda. I'm sorry, Amanda. You know, we're only, we're only messing. But uh, thanks for your email, and I hope you're writing again. Vic Tayback. <laughs> <laughs> just cut it there. Um, okay. Who the fuck is Vic Tayback? <laughs> Bloody hell. Hi guys, Gore Blimey here on Twitter as at I'm Gore Blimey. Here are my comments on Massacre Mansion or Mansion of the Damned. I won't go into the details of the plot as you'll have already covered that, but In a nutshell, the start felt a bit like Eyes Without a Face, the end felt a bit like Maniac, and the rest had a kind of made-for-TV movie feel. An unusually gruesome TV movie, obviously, and not in a bad way. Once again, we have a film from the list that's obsessed with eyeballs, but in this case, there's not a ping-pong ball in sight. Thank goodness. Though we do get someone crying, my eyes, my eyes, which gave me horrible flashbacks to a few episodes ago. This time the filmmaker took the different approach of adding in actual footage of eye surgery. I'm no expert, but rather than showing eye removal, it appears to be showing a cataract operation. 
In fact, the whole surgery thing is a bit odd anyway. Why does the doctor have to cut off the person's entire upper eyelid? Wouldn't he use those bent fork instrument things we saw earlier that hold them open instead? There doesn't seem to be any discussion with the daughter about wanting to operate on her again and again, which is a bit odd. And it's strange how the wife just gets the scrubs out and helps out with the surgery without hesitation. I did like the makeup though. I thought the eyeless people in the cellar looked pretty good, and the shock of seeing the first victim post-op was a genuinely scary moment. The cinematography is an odd combination of really effective, like the way the faces are lit and filmed in the operation scenes, and stuff that just didn't really work at all, like filming a car chase from the backseat of a car behind the driver. The other thing I wasn't keen on was all the narration that inner monologue stuff, it just felt a bit lazy and kept taking me out of the film. There are other ways of communicating to us what a character's thinking without just spelling it out in a voiceover. OK, OK, I don't want this to sound like I really disliked the film, though. Honestly, I enjoyed it overall and I had a lot of fun watching it. It's got a dark story, there's some creepy scenes and enough campy moments to keep me amused in between. I mean... There are rats that sound like someone stepped on a squeaky dog toy, and a character tries to bury a body in bright sunshine next to a smoke machine. When it gets to the end, we get a decent conclusion. I thought it was a nice touch when the closing credits started rolling, and then we saw the survivors coming out into the daylight. The Doctor gets a suitably gory comeuppance, and as for his daughter, she is one of the few people you can genuinely point at and say she has a mother's eyes. Hello, gentlemen. Well, that was an, um, interesting double bill, but certainly not a bad one. Firstly, mansion of the doomed, or the damned, or the bloke with all the eyeless folks in his cellar, as I like to think of it. Despite the assorted lurid titles and cover art I saw online, I thought this was a relatively slick and somewhat polished and thoughtful affair. And while not perhaps stunningly directed... It certainly showed a degree of competence and professionalism that we don't often see on the Section 3 list. I have a rough theory forming that if you do a horror movie which is any way to do with eyes, you are straight on to Section 3. I quite enjoyed this movie, but on reflection, I did feel that the slow burn nature was, well, a little bit too slow. And for while it had a good premise, I don't think the slow build-up actually, in the end, really quite got anywhere, and you had the feeling of the movie just petering out rather than reaching, if you'll pardon the pun, an eye-popping climax. And on the whole, I think the storyline perhaps would have worked better in a shorter format. A 50-minute episode, say, of some horror anthology show would have fitted it just fine, I think. So on to the second feature, The Mad Blood of Dr. Island's Curse, or whatever the hell it was called. I'm not entirely sure. I'm still a bit woozy from all that handheld strobing camera work. Now, I'd heard about this movie and its ilk and the marvellous documentary Machete Maidens Unleashed, so I was quite looking forward to sampling some of these strange exploitation films. And I have to say, I was kind of impressed. Yes, it was quite obviously an attempt to make a cheap buck, and was pretty much all built around the idea of some cheesy-looking monsters, lots of boobs, and some El Cheapo gore effects. However, what impressed me was the attempt actually to try and tell a proper story. Well, a proper B-picture monster movie story, at any rate. In fact, I rather felt it was a shame that the production was so clearly very, very cheap, because although it was clearly an exploitation film there was a genuine desire to entertain the audience and not just film any old substandard nonsense to pad out the running time in between the gratuitous nudity and gore. It had the feel of a 40s or 50s B-movie horror flick and, as I'm quite fond of that kind of cheesy end of the genre, I did have a lot of fun with this. And from a cinematic history viewpoint... I thought it was very interesting how this particular film pretty much established a template that would be used again and again in 70s and 80s Italian gut munchers. 
I just wish I'd whipped up a test tube of some potent green alcoholic beverage and take the green blood oath. Then again, maybe it was best I didn't, as with the strobe camera work, I might have done some very verdant chundering. We have an email from Daniel Budnick, who is uh, one of the co-hosts on the Made for TV Mayhem podcast, along with Amanda. And he's written uh, some information here, his thoughts and feedback on both of the films. He begins with Mad Doctor of, Mad Doctor of Blood Island. And he says, I've never been as big a fan of Filip- Filipino horror as I should be. <laughs> Racist. No, just jokes. Uh, don't take it seriously. Uh, to me, it's a lot like the films of Paul Nashi. When you read about them or see a still from one, they sound like the best things ever. Watching them is a different affair. Both the Filipino films and the Nashi films tend to be kind of bland movies with occasional flashes of excitement or moments of wonkiness but uh, mostly kind of blah at least the uh, Nashi films have beautiful Spanish scenery the Blood Island setting isn't the most inviting so Mad Doctor of Blood Island I thought it was okay I went into it with a great excitement there's a monster around a mad scientist Angelic Petty John John Ashley something to do with chlorophyll it all seemed to be in place then time passed I found myself looking at the screen but not terribly interested in what was happening the explanation for the monster is suitably loopy but even though I watched it a day ago my memories are leaking away I remember a green guy I remember a scene with Petty John sitting up in bed. She's wearing a low-cut nightgown, and I thought, I haven't watched a Russ Meyer film in ages. But that's about it, you randy devil. Daniel, thinking about that. Uh, I used to watch a lot of Russ Meyer films when I was a kid. I used to be, you know, see a few boobies, Tom. I was young. I was young, and I needed it. I needed to send the blood that way. (laughs) And indeed, I did. I always remember Beneath the Valley of the Ultra Vixens. That was a particular favourite of mine. Oh, just getting all getting all clammy thinking about it now. Uh, I've seen some of the other Blood Island movies, and all I remember is that one of them had an actress named Beverly Hills in it. Oh. Uh, they just don't stay in my mind. It's not badly made, it's just blandly made, which might be a worse crime. I agree with that. Uh, I think I will savour it for the few moments I can remember, and if you want to watch a great Filipino film, I'll throw on For Your Height Only with Weng Weng. <laughs> yeah, that's what's a... That sounds good. Mm. Um, that's the good stuff. Have you ever heard of that one? Uh, for your high time, with Weng Weng? I can't say I have. No, I can't. You, know, you don't know about Weng Weng, mate. What's wrong with you? <laughs> what is wrong with you, Tom? Uh, he goes on to talk about Mansion of the Doom now. Oh, good. Uh, don't... good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, don't let people trick you into thinking that Laser Blast is the best film Charles Band produced. <laughs> I don't think anyone could convince me of that, Dan. Um, that would be Eliminators. But as a, I've never even seen a little this, but as a close second, you can't go wrong with Mansion of the Doomed. Richard Basehart is awesome. Gloria Graham is great. Vic Tabak should have been in the film more. We were saying that, weren't we, Tom, earlier? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the t- <laughs> Vic Tabak should have been in it more. Definitely. I agree. He was definitely missing his, uh, his charisma and, and screen presence were, uh, I think, were the missing key, really, to have you know, shot my rating up more. Yeah, you wouldn't have called it a little bit dull if uh, there was more Tabak in it, that's for sure. more more Vic Tabak in there and it's directed by Michael Pataki Mm. eye violence always makes me a bit queasy so I girded my loins mm, before watching I'm glad I did because there are a couple of lovely gross moments I am very surprised that all the things doctors can stick into the human eye and the uh, eye seems okay with it they're more resilient than we thought I mean I wouldn't try it Dan if I were you I wouldn't the eyeless people in the cage were suitably creepy and sympathetic. The Doctor's plan doesn't seem like the smartest because these people generally have their wits about them. It's not like the caged naked cannibal women in blood-sucking freaks who have lost their minds. These eyeless people are alive and hate base heart very much. They can't see, but they can get revenge. Oh, I live in Los Angeles. If I was driving down the street and a woman who clearly seemed to be blind wandered out into traffic, I'd stop for her. When that lady wanders into traffic, people beep and drive by. Then she gets hit and killed and all you hear are horns beeping. Come on, Bataki, says Dan. Uh, People in Los Angeles can be douche nozzles, but we're not all that bad. Someone would have done something. The thought of the poor daughter having useless eyeballs dug out of her ocular cavity and replaced with another pair over and over again would make anyone tired. Dad, I get it. I saw eyes without a face too. But grafting skin seems less traumatic than taking eyeballs in and out every other day. 
And what about that scene with the little girl? This is the exact moment when society begin, began teaching kids to say no to strangers. Of course, if Richard Basehart said he'd take me to Disneyland, I might go and risk the violence to my eyes. Hey, life's a crapshoot. You take your chances and you end up on Space Mountain or eyeless in an electrified cage tended to by an Academy Award winning actress. Is he saying there that child molestation is okay? Is that what... No, more like removing a child's eyes is okay. All right. Okay. That's, thank you, Tom. You're uh, like my grandma always said, shit happens and then you die. <laughs> Take a few motherfuckers down with it. Blimey, your grandma sounds hardcore. Uh, that might not fully relate to the movie, but I thought I'd share. I give this film four out of five tips up the div. Tips uh, up the div. Yeah. In the, uh, in the Strange and Deadly group chat that we have on Twitter, which some people are a part of, I once made a sleepy comment where I was trying to... A div is is a silly British nickname for somebody's butthole. And I, th- I thought a good euphemism for anal sex would be tips up the div. Like, you know, putting your penis up, up there. Tips up the div. Right, right. Thanks for the feedback, Dan. Mm. All right, so thank you very much, everybody, for all of your feedback, the audio stuff, and, of course, the emails that we read out there. Uh, Myron, of course, had something to say. I like the fact that Myron, his feedback tends to be more from the gut. He doesn't really, he doesn't get too academic with it. He just sort of says whether he likes a film or not, really, and uh, seemed to kind of enjoy these Mm -hmm. uh, a decent amount. Uh, I mean, we didn't really dislike anything on this one, did we? We didn't think Mad Doctor of Blood Island was that great, but we we didn't truly dislike anything here. No. So, which is a good thing. And then, of course, we had um, a word from Andrew. They're always very well researched. Like, I always get the feeling that he knows more about the films than we do. Yeah. But uh, you're not the one recording it, Andrew. So stick that up, your bloody spout. Uh, so that's his uh, Andrew Roberts. And, yeah, it made, made some interesting points there. Of course, as I mentioned before, uh, he said that the uh, sex scene between Bill and uh, Sheila was unsimulated originally, according to that actress anyway. So that's um, yeah. an interesting thing. That, that was an explicit sex scene that got cut down. Um, yeah, very interesting. And again, it didn't seem to um, have a have a have a problem with either of these films. Really, we seem to have reached a, a good balance on this one, where it seems like nobody is is ter- was terribly offended by by Blood Island, and everybody seemed to kind of dig Mansion of the Doom, didn't they? What about Gore, Blimey, and Jim Moon? There, yeah, I mean, Gore pretty much uh, enjoyed a bit of Mansion of the Doomed as well, and we got a little bit of a, a new thing to mention with Gore, Blimey a bit later on. So keep your ears open for that. And um, Jim, sort of with you a bit more on Mansion of the Doom, thought it was a bit slow, but seemed to really kind of dig Blood Island, probably more than us uh, from the sounds of it. Um, he likes, you know, Jim's into some weird shit, to be honest, <laughs> in, in the best possible way. You know, he, he does love oh, yeah. a, a B-movie, um, so I can I can see where he's come from and I can see why it would appeal to Jim, who's still out there doing his hypnagoria thing and going from mm. strength to strength. Done some great shows lately. Yeah, and, and, and a v- incredibly varied taste in films, first of all, from, you know, horror films from all sorts of eras. And and also he's doing a history of Batman at the moment, which makes me want to kiss him on the ring. Good, good. You should uh, you should definitely do that. I will. I'm going to write to him after this, send him a direct message on Twitter and see if he's up for it. Great. Okay, so that's our feedback. <laughs> and uh, if you want to send us some thoughts, then email us at feedback at strangeanddeadly.com. All right, so that's it, guys. That's going to be the end of the show. Now, before we go, of course, we always give you information on how you can find us. Now, uh, the Strange and Deadly Twitter account is Strange Deadly, at Strange Deadly, no and in there. Tom, where can they find you on your various accounts? Uh, I tend to go by the name of Grindhouse Tom. And I am Grand House Tom on Instagram and Twitter. Yep. And you can find me on Twitter at the Chris Clayton. And you can find me under that name on Instagram, on Letterboxd. You're on Letterboxd as well now, Tom. I am. Actually, yeah. I've seen yeah, I've seen you post a thing on there now and again. Yeah, occasionally. Occasionally. Yeah. So he's on there. I'm on Letterboxd. The Chris Clayton on Instagram. All the different places you can find us. You can talk to us. We love to hear from you. If you want to send feedback in to the show we highly encourage it and we tend to hear from the same people over and over again now, and that's 
brilliant we love hearing from you but of course if there's anybody listening out there who's ever thought i would like to send something in doesn't just have to be about the films we're covering you can just send in some comments queries questions tell us you love us um don't tell us you hate us just tell us you love us really if you do hate us don't bother writing in uh, you can leave us reviews on itunes of course we always like to see uh, some new ones on there just leave us a five star review it really helps the more reviews you leave for us the more star ratings you give us you know, the more our show gets known, we're a little tiny thing, really, in the grand scheme of things, but uh, it always helps to let people know what we're up to. And there's a couple of new things happening at the moment. So, I mean, first of all, um, why don't we plug the thing that you're doing first, and then we'll talk about some of our friends. You've got a little show going at the moment, a new thing, which is kind of bolstered onto an old thing, isn't it? Explain. Yeah, I, um, you know, a while back I, I had... See, me and you always have ideas, don't we? We always, let's do a podcast about this. Um, but I, I did one called Gentleman's Grand House Radio, and it was interviews. And, you know, we had people like Tony Todd on there, um, Bobby Wild, uh, Gary Smart, who made the Hellraiser documentary. And I recently released an interview with Caroline Williams, who played Stretch mm. in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Um, you know, one of the fa- my favourite ones, because she was just fantastic but i i figured you know i'm not gonna chase interviews all the time it's it's a it's a young man's game so they say I, you know it takes a lot of effort staying on top of that kind of thing so i thought you know why not use that for other things a, a bit of a more of a loose format show you know sometimes because sometimes we say you know i wish we could talk about this but it doesn't really fit with strange and deadly well maybe we can do it over there on Gentleman's mm-hmm. Grand House Radio occasionally and that that all depends on time you know we're committed to getting strange and deadly done at the moment so you know it's always going to be an occasional podcast but check it out especially for that Caroline Williams interview it's called Gentleman's Grand House Radio and I, I think you'll enjoy it and you know it's going to be a a lot of different stuff as time goes on but just occasional stuff really yeah and it's just you on there Tom I, I try to get in uh, denied Denied from uh, felt that my talent was not uh, useful or good enough to have um, been placed alongside you, but that's absolutely fine. Uh, no, he, Tom does a very good job with interviews on there, and um, and yeah, do check it out, please. It's Gentleman's Grindhouse Radio. You can add it to your subscriptions. So if you are listening to this show, of course, you know, there's loads of other stuff on the Gentleman's Grindhouse Records network, including a new show from Mr. Gore Blimey, one of the great friends of the show. Um, a lovely chap. I speak to him often. Mm. And uh, occasionally, I send him a heartfelt message that isn't just insults. <laughs> Mostly insults. But uh, occasionally, a heartfelt message because he's a heartfelt boy. And uh, he's got a new show, hasn't he, called Trilogy of Terror. He has, and uh, very well produced and mm, uh, entertaining good. it is too. Yeah, and it's fairly short. He only does them once a month at the moment. Um, hopefully, you know, if you get some free time in, in the future, you might be able to do more than that. But once a month, they're short shows. And, yeah, I was quite impressed by how well produced they are, considering a lot of podcasts are, are produced pretty sloppily. His is um, yeah. it's pretty good and, and put together well, and it's got his humour in it. And, and uh, yeah, so really good. So check it out. There's one episode out there at the moment, Trilogy of Terror. And, um, and do check it out, because I think there's going to be another one pretty soon. Mm-hmm. So that is a good listing. And also uh, our friend John Cottage... Uh, he changed his name on Twitter. I can't remember what he was before, but I, he's, I think he was Captain Spaulding before, but now he's Johnny Zombie. It's J O L N Y Z O M B I, no E on the end. Johnny Zombie. And he's got a, a podcast which I, I haven't listened to yet. I think he's only got a test episode up, um, but it's called Carnage. Mm. And uh, yeah, that'll be very interesting. Uh, good chap. Um, got a very interesting view on horror films. Tends to be, I, I would say, based on some of the written reviews I've seen, a little bit more acerbic, I think, than what we tend to be on this. And, and that's interesting. I, I, I like something that challenges. So check that out as well. It's on iTunes at the moment, a test episode of Carnage from uh, Mr. John Cottage. I, I get the feeling you'll enjoy that. Or if you won't, don't blame me. And just a quick mention as well for a, a chap called um, John who uh, contacted me recently about uh, his podcast. He's a Liverpool gentleman, and uh, as are the other people on his show i think there's about four hosts on it um and it's a show called scream queens and uh they're all gay men and they uh the whole sort of angle on that show is is to give 
their kind of perspective on horror movies so it's it's really quite interesting it's very fun but they kind of get down to the the nitty-gritty on things as well so yeah it's a good time worth a listen mm. oh brilliant you uh liver puddly lights bloody taking over everything aren't you mm, definitely yeah first the the beatles and now this so uh listen to <laughs> scream queens and uh yeah, it'll be a good time for all. And uh, thank you very much for listening to this episode of The Strange and Deadly Show. It's been a while, I know. Um, we are planning to come back again um, in, in a fortnight. We Hopefully we're on a good path now. We can get this done. Because we were just saying before we started, before we hit the record button on this, that Tom, we're only, what, 15 or so episodes away from finishing this thing. That's right. We're on the home stretch, kind of. So, I mean, it'll still take us probably the best part of this year, won't it? But... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're getting there, we're getting there. Yeah, the question becomes, when we've finished the Section 3 list, do we continue from there, or is this the end? Well, you're going to have to wait to find out, aren't you? Mm-hmm. The very final episode will reveal the information then. But we hope you've enjoyed this one. Tom, what's coming up on the next episode, episode 26? Well, things are coming full circle. Back to the topic from our original first episode. We're back to cannibals again. Mm. with two movies Eaten Alive and Savage Terror aka Primitives yeah and Eaten Alive is an Umberto Lenzi film I believe I don't think I've seen that one I definitely haven't seen Savage Terror I know that much and yeah you know we said on the the very first episode of the show that we're not massive fans of the cannibal genre really the cannibal subgenre. Yeah, um, but we've watched a lot of shit since then, so you never know. Maybe we'll come round. <laughs> you never know. Maybe that's going to be an improvement on some of those crappy, you know, rapey films that we saw a few episodes ago. Yeah, but I actually just got the Cannibal Holocaust the release you were telling me about, the one with the, um, you know, the the new Diodato cut on it. Oh, and right. I'm quite looking forward to seeing that. I might actually end up watching that just to sort of get me in the, in the mood for it, if you can believe that. Um, but yeah, cannibals, we're going back to the theme on the very first episode of The Strange and Deadly Show. It's Eaten Alive and Savage Terror, a.k.a. Primitives, on episode 26 of Strange and Deadly Show. Thank you very much for listening. I've been Chris Clayton. And I'm Tom Elliott. And we will see you again on another episode of The Strange and Deadly Show, brought to you by Gentleman's Grindhouse Bloody Records. Goodbye for now. Bye. been listening to the strange and deadly show brought to you by gentlemen's grindhouse records with me chris clayton and tom elliott thank you to danny davis for the music and to dark ink one for the artwork you can visit our website at gentlemen's grindhouse records.com you